Welcome back to the Outdoors Photography Podcast, where we share experiences out in the field and educate others through landscapes, wildlife, macro, and more with photographers from around the world. In today's episode, we have Tom Croce on the show. Welcome, Tom. Thank you. Thanks. Glad to be here. So you are a nature and outdoor fine art photographer uh, based out of Southwest Ohio. Um, you capture images of mammals, landscapes, and uh, lots of different stuff outdoors. Uh, so to start off, uh, tell us about what stories you want to share through your photography. Well, you know, I, I really have um, gotten kind of really involved with the th thinking about conservation and in our relationship to nature. And I mean, I, I would say the overreaching um, goal that I have with my images is to just almost reintroduce people to, to the outdoors and the beauty of, of just being outdoors and, and hopefully encouraging them to get outdoors again, because again, um, I think as we get outdoors and experience these things um, in person, you know, and, and have shared experiences and, and, and actually see the beauty that's all around us, we are way more likely to care about it and then want to do the little, every little thing we can to, to try and um, protect it and, and conserve it, you know, because we're, you know, um, some of the things that I've been working on, I, I've spent the last couple of years working on, um, Photographing in the Great Plains and the prairies, um, you know, along the Dakotas and Nebraska and Kansas and some of those areas. And, you know, it, it's just shocking that that those areas are, are one of the, um, I guess, most endangered ecosystem in the world. Um, and it's right here, in, you know, <laughs> in the middle of our, our country. And, you know, we hear a lot about the rainforests and we hear a lot about other areas, but yet, you know, the, the the Great Plains is disappearing at a faster rate than any place, any of the other um, ecosystems in the world. And, you know, it, it's just, it's shrinking at an alarming rate. And the impact on the climate is just, you know, can, 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 it can be catastrophic if we, if we don't kind of think about, you know, preserving these, some of these areas. So that, that's really kind of, I think the area that I've been really interested in with my photography is getting people to take a look at some of these overlooked areas, you know, like the Great Plains and the prairies, um, because they really are just fascinating and, and beautiful in their own way, kind of environments. Yes, yeah, so, definitely. Yeah. And for those who don't know, um, what kind of subjects do you shoot um, when you go out? You know, I, I really, um, I, I think my, my first love is, is landscapes um, and really black and white landscapes because I think this, the, the, the black and white um, or monochrome just really helps, is, I feel it's more expressive in terms of trying to convey the feeling and emotion of the place in a more powerful and dramatic way. Um, I think once you start removing some of the color, you're left with, you know, a lot more of this, the, the, Let's say the simple elements you're you know you're forced to really reduce it to the basics of the lines and the forms and the shapes and textures and how light is playing off all of those forms and shapes in order to reveal them and you know how the shadows are playing off each other and in you know relating with the light and so it, it to my aesthetic it just is a much more dramatic and compelling image um and then i i do shoot some wildlife um I consider myself a little bit more of a, um, a uh, just opportunistic wildlife photographer, though, it's, you know, because I really, you know, I, I don't go off in, in some of these great big adventures. Um, so, but I, I've, you know, it's mainly related to some of the other, like I was just talking about the Great Plains. It's, it's so I, I will shoot a lot of the wildlife associated with those things because it's an important part of the story. You know, we have to have um, all of these critters and all of the, the plants and, and things that make up the a healthy ecosystem. So it's like in order for me to tell the story of the Great Plains, I, I have to include things like the, you know, bison and, and pronghorn and deer and some of these other, these other animals and all the way down to the small stuff like the prairie dogs and, and, and some of those, those critters as well. Um, I, and then, you know, I'm not a true macro photographer. I, I do love to shoot the, you know, the wildlife or the wildflowers and some of those types of things as well. Um, in a you know in a more close-up fashion so um but I, I i'm not really consider myself a true you know macro photographer either i'm kind of like a little bit of a master of um you know master of all trade or or you know what do you, you know uh um, 
Jack of all trades. Jack of all trades. There we go. Yeah, Jack of all trades and master of none. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm a little bit of a, uh, you know, I dabble in a little bit of everything, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely perfect for being on the show, of course. Yeah, so, yeah, it's cool how, that, like, I guess with you, it's like doing the caption landscapes, but then it's, it's like almost like the wildlife images maybe, like, play a supporting role, like you said, in the whole, I guess, storytelling aspect of photography, too. Yeah, you know, and, and I, I mean, with the wildlife, you know, I, I feel like a lot of the, you know, I see it a lot out in the field with wildlife and people are always trying to, you know, they got to have that portrait, you know, we all want that close up portrait of the, of the animals. And, and, you know, I am way more likely to stand back and, and try and include the whatever critter it is in, in the landscape, you know, to tell that more complete story of, of how they're interacting with their environment. And, you know, a lot of times I'll, I'll just sit and wait and, and watch what they do. And, um, you know, occasionally they will come and you, and you can, you know, you can get that great portrait shot of, of, of whatever animal it is. But, you know, I always tell I believe it, it was their decision to come close to me. You know, I'm not pressuring them in any way. They're, they're just relaxed, they're natural. And that's really the, I think the ideal kind of wildlife photograph I, I would like to get. Yeah, definitely something. It's a lot more natural, of course, too. Uh, so, yeah, talking about the bigger picture here with the Great Plains, like what exactly is contributing to that, um, I guess, you know, conservation of it and even habitat loss? Uh, it's mostly that most of it has been, you know, just turned into farmland. Um, you know, it's the where a big part of the, you know, our, our you know, uh, crops and things are grown. And so most of it has just been tilled into into for farmland. Um, and a big part of that is is that was um, it's a lot of you know fair, fairly loose you know s- soil. Um, it's not real hard. It was easy to plow. Um, so it just was very you know convenient, I guess, in a way to turn it into turn it into the a lot of farmland. Um, what's kind of interesting is this uh, uh, the Flint Hills in Kansas is an area where um, it's one of the largest um, remaining areas of tall grass prairie that's left in the in, in North America um, and in a hundred in less than 200 years we've you know completely I mean more than 95 percent of the Great Plains and the prairies have been you know tilled and converted into farmland the largest area the large, and this the uh, Flint Hills in Kansas again is the largest tract of remaining tall grass prairie left in North America, and it's only 17 square miles. Um, so from over, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of acres to 17 square miles left, it's just, you know, it's kind of appalling and, and scary in a way, because it's still, it's still happening. You know, we get up into the Northern Plains and the Dakotas and things, and it's still, you know, a lot of land's being converted for farmland. Um, and, you know, the only reason this area of Kansas <clears throat> survived <clears throat> is because it was too rocky to plow <laughs> so you know it couldn't couldn't be converted or, or we wouldn't even have that but it's it's just a glimpse of, of what you know what it must have been like you know 150 or 200 years ago um there's bison roaming out in the fields and you just you know you have to get out in the prairie to experience it you know um you get out and walk the prairie and then all of a sudden it really you start to see the the life um because <clears throat> from your car or you know, as a drive-by, all you, you know, it's very flat, kind of very gently rolling hills, but you, until you get in it, then you see the birds and all the immense amount of wildlife that is in there and just the beauty of the land. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's so interesting. So what, what got you into, uh, sorry, Ryan, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that, that's really interesting, though. I mean, is it like, so the people that till up that land for farmland and croplands, um, do they really, are they aware of what they're doing, like the, the ramifications of it, maybe? Or are they just kind of just letting that kind of notion go? Well, you know, I, I don't honestly know. I think a lot of it was done, you know, historically. I don't think, you know, I, I think there, I, I do know in Kansas, for instance, there's a lot of the, a lot of the, um, land now is, is, is used for, for grazing cattle and things like that. So they, they're, they're actually working with some of the, the conservancy groups and things like that to restore some of the, some of that, um, you know, tall grass for the prairies. And I, I mean, it's amazing. This, this, these plants have adapted, you know, over centuries to live in, in a very, you know, low rain, you know, 
area they're adapted for fire you know they've actually now do a lot of prescribed burns because it just helps keep the, the prairie intact so um so the, yes they're actually I, I think there's hope because you know a lot of the areas are working with the conservancy groups and things like that to, to you know kind of find some kind of a balance between you know the land that can be used for grazing and and, and still you know preserve some of the the history and and you know the importance of these these grasslands and things. Um, the amount of carbon that they store is you know because it's just such a vast area. They're capable of storing so much carbon, you know, compared to um, most other places in North America here. So, you know, the potential for for helping the climate out is, is huge. Yeah, definitely. Um, grasslands yeah. are definitely one of the most critically endangered habitats. Like I'd say, large parts of the country too, like that. Yes. Yep. So what, what got you in originally into this nature of photography and then what led you to advocate for the planes like this? Well, you know, I, I, I grew up as just a nature, you know, fanatic, I guess, you know, I was telling you, you guys are too young, but when I was uh, a, a young kid, there used to be a show that was on Sunday night. It was mutual of Omaha's wild kingdom. You know, and, and, you know, they'd go out to Africa and show all the, you know, the wildlife and things. And that was just something I was glued to the television every Sunday evening for an hour. Um, and just, you know, crawling around the woods, doing all that kind of stuff as a kid. Um, and so then once I started getting back into photography, it just, it really just took off. I mean, once I got behind the camera and started looking, you know, at something I already loved being out in nature and, and the nature, it was just, you know, I, I just got completely absorbed by it and then you know kind of realizing that you know you can tell a story with with some of these images and actually have some hopefully some positive impact on, on you know on a bigger scale than just taking a few a few pictures you know it, it's kind of uh, daunting and overwhelming to a degree you know um, and I guess is what I what really drew me to the plains was um, I guess my first trip to South Dakota um, it's just such an amazing landscape and being, um, in the middle of several hundred thousand acres of, of prairie and, you know, where the horizon just stretches on forever and, and the sky is just, you know, you, you, the horizon just seems like it's infinite, you know, I'm watching some storms come in and, and being so far away from the storms that, you, you know, you see the lightning and, and you still don't hear the thunder just because they're, they're still so far away. Um, and as I got into the landscape and you start to find all the little subtleties of it, just, I think it appealed to me as a, as a photographer because it was such a kind of a unique and challenging landscape. Um, but I felt like it was kind of a, a little bit of an untold story and maybe a, you know, a, that, that I could maybe do something to help help get a little bit more information out. And as I got more into it, as I began to keep, kept photographing it, I kept learning more about it. I started to real, you know, learn about the, the, the actually how much under threat it, it actually is. And, and I just feel like, you know, it's just now, you know, really has become a passion um, to just keep trying to tell this story. It's part of our heritage as, a, as a, you know, basically as the, we moved, you know, to the West. And, and so I, I just think it's an amazing, compelling story. Some of the landforms in Nebraska and Kansas, even, you know, Kansas, we think Kansas is perfectly flat. You know, it's just a big flat pancake until you get out there and walk it and really spend some time walking around through these grasses and, you know, seeing the animals and, and just, it's, you know, it's hard not to get, you know, really taken in by it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So focusing in here a little bit, um, what are some like your favorite locations to hike at, shoot at in the plains here? Um, well, you know, I really loved the uh, Flint Hills in Kansas. Um, again, it's there's a uh, tall grass prairie uh, preserve that's a little bit uh, southwest of Topeka. Um, and there, that's actually where they, they do, they have that large the area of, of you know, conservation. It, it was done with the conservation, the Nature Conservancy. Um, and it's it's just, it's a beautiful place. You, you do have to get out and walk it though. I mean, you know, you'll walk, you'll put in several miles just walking, walking through the prairie and seeing the, 
you know, all the birds and the, the bison and all the animals. It's, it's just amazing. Um, after that, I really, the, the, the Badlands in South Dakota, um, again, it's even, you know, that's a small area of the plains, but it's really surrounded by a, a, what's considered up there is a mixed grass prairie as you get further north, you know. Um, and I've just, again, right, you just get absorbed by it. It's just amazing to me that these, these plants and, and animals have been able to survive in such a harsh, you know, environment with it's it's you know they get a couple of inches of rain a year um it's just a pretty amazing amazing place it's otherworldly that's the best word i can come up with to describe it um i just got back from there in may i was out there for two weeks um just really you know trying to spend some more time out there it seems like as long as i'm out there it's never long enough yeah do you Will you camp out there or do you stay in a hotel or what, what do you do out there? Well, I did camp out there for the first part of the trip. And then um, we had some extremely high winds that, that changed my plans. So, um, Oh gosh. My, yeah. My, my tent didn't, didn't survive the 55 mile an hour winds. Um, so uh, yeah, we ended up, ended up going to a hotel in the little, there's a little town wall, wall, South Dakota. Um, which is just right outside the, the national park and adjacent to the grasslands in some of that area. So it's pretty close, but yeah, it's, I prefer to camp out there. It's nice just to, you know, you get the sounds mm -hmm. of overnight, you know, you hear the coyotes and the, you know, they seem like they're right next door to you. And, you know, um, it's not uncommon to wake up and look out your tent and have a, have a bison, you know, standing 25, 30 feet away, you know? Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. They just wander through, you know, and you just hope they don't decide to wander through your tent. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm curious, what do you do when you get like a close encounter with a bison? Usually you try, try not to do much, you know, um, on something like that, you know, I, I've learned you just really, you kind of open your tent pretty carefully. So you don't want to spook anybody. Um, but mostly, you know, if I'm out, and I'm, I'm photographing, I'm, I've really planned my, my positioning pr pretty well to make sure that I don't get in a, in a, you know, awkward position or stuck between, you know, two bison or something like that. Um, I have had a couple close calls, but, um, you know, managed to, the one, I did have to crawl into my car window one time, but other than that, uh, I've been pretty lucky. Um, I had an idea I was going to try and, and set up my camera right outside a prairie dog hole and use a remote re release. So as soon as that prairie dog popped out of the hole, I wanted to, you know, have a, get a shot of it with a wide angle lens. And so I was intently watching this prairie dog hole, waiting for this thing to pop up. And the next thing I know, there was a herd of buffalo decided to just wander through. And um, oh, I was, gosh. yeah, so and I just, I was just praying that they didn't decide to take my camera out <laughs> or decide it was something they should they, they need to check out so <laughs> but um yeah they're 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 just they're all they're amazing animals they're just they're so massive so, so f strong just yeah it's good to hear that there's great numbers in places other than you know wyoming and and whatnot it's cool to hear these more lesser known places have a good population of bison as well yeah, there's, you know, I don't know what the herd is in, in, in South Dakota, but there's, there's hundreds. So it's a pretty, it's, it's amazing to see them. It's a small glimpse of, of, you know, what things must have been like a couple hundred years ago. Right, right. right. Do you like incorporate the, like the bison or wildlife in your landscape photography at all? I do, I do. Um, you know, there's um, occasionally, you know, they'll, they'll you know, they will wander in. And it's amazing some of the places they, they get to. So yeah, if I can find the, the right situation where they're, um, you know, maybe an individual bison might be standing on one of the buttes or one of the, the plateaus in the Badlands or, you know, um, it was really amazing to see them just stretched out across the, there's one of the upper plateaus in, in, in the grasslands where it's just, you know, ache, as far as you can see, it's nothing but grass. And just see hundreds of bison standing out in there, just you know, milling around, uh, grazing, doing their thing. You know, it, it's just it's 
kind of awe inspiring really it really is it's just it's an incredible experience mm -hmm. um one of the best experiences i think i've ever really had though was out in, in kansas because they also have some bison out there in the, the nature in the uh, tall grass prairie there um it's a it's an area where you like I, i've been saying you have to get out and walk you know, and so as I was walking through the, the prairie, basically there's, you know, there's no separation between, you know, between you and any of these, these animals. And just to be, have that experience being, you know, I wasn't terribly close, but there was absolutely no separation between me and this herd of buffalo. And, you know, it was just a, an incredibly intense experience um, just to be, you know, you're out there with them in their environment and, you know it was just a great experience and i always tell people if you ever get the chance to go walk among among a herd of buffalo be careful but, but do it <laughs> because it is a moving experience yeah that's awesome yeah what are some like other subjects you may shoot out on the plains um you know mostly a lot of landscapes um one of the things i love about you know, the plains and the Badlands especially is just, the, it's an incredibly unique landscape. It's, it's um, you know, it's basically just all the, we have, the upper plateau is just eroding, you know, and, and washing down into the lower plateau. So anytime you get these, you know, some of these concretions and rocks that are sitting on top of some of the softer soil, as they erode, you get this incredible formations of buttes and um, pinnacles and things like that and, and there's some areas that really do look otherworldly it's hard to believe that they're they're really part of the same planet that we're on because they're they're just um it's this really light gray clay earth with very few things growing in it um and when the sun gets on it it just becomes this crack baked kind of you know earth and it's just um it's just amazing so it's the landscapes really and finding, you know, a lot of some, sometimes the close up landscapes and looking for, you know, interesting formations and details in the, in the, in the rocks and in the formations and things like that. Um, one of the best things that I find about being out there is the, um, in May, which I just came again, is the storms. Um, the weather is just so volatile, especially in the spring. Um, you can have, you know, all, all four seasons in one day, practically. Um, but some of the, and again, with the incredible views and how far you can see the storms just come rolling in and you can just really get some incredibly dramatic weather that, that can that can happen. And it's just gonna make for some really beautiful um, pictures. Mm -hmm. yeah, definitely, yeah. Uh, how often do you like, you incorporate lots of fine art photography in your work. Like how often do you take shots that are more maybe like documentarian or how many are like more like a artistic style, let's say like a textural shot of those rock walls. You know, I, I really, um, I don't know that I take most, almost anything that I would kind of consider is just a documentary type photograph. Um, I'm always looking for that kind of unique or, you know, kind of what I'll call an artistic shot or a creative shot. Um, and I think, you know, um, Stieglitz, um, and I, I heard this quote from Ansel Adams quoting Stieglitz, and I'll know, was that his definition of what created a, um, a, a more artistic shot from, a, from a, either a documentary or a snapshot was that, you know, in a snapshot or, or the doc, you're recording some external event. You know, you're, you're seeing something, you're taking a picture of it as a record of what happened. The artistic shot is actually more of the photograph of the experience and being there. What, what I was feeling at the time when I took it, what do I want the photograph to express to the viewer? Um, you know, the emotions just, you know, it, it does have the storytelling aspect of it, but it's more of based on how the place was feeling at the time, trying to create, you know, that experience in the photograph, similar to the experience that I had when I was standing there. Um, so I, I kind of try to shoot everything that way. Um, so it's, you know, I, I don't really take something and say it's strictly for documenting something. Um, so you know. with the, the emotional side of your photography, what, what are some of the techniques specifically you use to kind of bring out those emotions? 
know, that's a great question. It's, it's, I think it's one of the more difficult things, you know, to, to do. Um, and I think part of the reason, you know, uh, come back with the fairly low <laughs> keeper rate is because it is so hard to do. Um, mm -hmm. But I think, you know, in general, what I, how I think about the, the whole episode or the whole experience of taking the photograph and what it, you know, what I'm thinking and feeling at the time is, you know, I generally am looking at, like, if it's a landscape, for instance, that, I, you know, I'll use the analogy of a, of a theater set, you know, I will see the landscape almost as that set where there's something that's going to occur, you know, in that situation, right? Um, whether it's the weather or whether it's an animal that's coming through or, or something about the light or something, there's something that's gonna animate that scene to help tell the story and create the emotional impact that I wanna convey in the photograph. That's Does that great. make sense? Yeah, yeah, that definitely. makes a lot of sense. Yeah, so it's always I'm looking for you know not just the the scene, right? It's what what is going to happen in that scene to make it come to life. Much, much mm, like a, okay, much like a play, you know. It's like I, I use the analogy, right? You don't go to to see a, a live play to to actually just see the stage, right? You go to see the performance. So I'm looking for what the performance that's going to occur in that landscape that's what I rely on, or that's what I'm looking for to create the emotional impact. And how, how often do, would you oh, that, say you set out to like create an image versus just react to the scene in front of you? Like if there's like a big storm or weather event in front of you, like how does that work with your photography? Well, um, I, you know, there's that old expression, right? We, you know, we plan and God laughs. Hmm. Um, so, you know, I, I think I always, I try and have a plan. Um, it, it feels to me like if I don't, I, I, you know, my success rate is a lot less. I, you know, a lot of times I won't even hardly get the camera out unless I really have a pretty good feeling for what I'm trying to do. Um, but having said that, right, you always have to be flexible and be ready to, to pack up and, and go to something, you know, that's maybe is going to be more successful than what I'm, what I'm trying to do. And, you know, like with storm clouds coming in and things like that, um, you know, it's, it's you just have to be ready to be on the move if something is happening and, and you know you can make a quick change to get to a better location or something like that I think you just have to be prepared to do that you know we always have the you know the fear in a way of, of you know what what are we going to miss right so there's always that dilemma do I stay here or, or do I you know kind of pack up and, and try and move to this other location and it's just you know you just make the call and go um, for something like that. But usually, you know, there's a lot of planning um, that goes into some of the shots. If I'm looking for, you know, um, a lot of times I'm checking for the, the phases of the moon um, to see if it's possible to get a good, either a good moon rise or moon set, you know, right around sunset and sunrise, you know, over the, it's just, again, one of those other things you can add that will help animate the scene and give it a little more, um, you know, a little more excitement, a little more drama. Um, so there's, there's that. You know, the, I think in general you can plan a little bit for the weather. Like I said, I love to go to the Badlands in, in May, because the chances of getting some dramatic weather are, are much higher than like late in the fall. Um, there's just, you know, not the thunderstorms and things like that that come through. And, you know, the risk is you end up with fifty some mile an hour winds that blow your tent down. You know. Um, but, um, you know, just move on, go keep going, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's, I always say, like, for outdoor photographers, it's almost like we have to play amateur weatherman, you know, just to get the shots we want, of course, too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's like, you know, and then, you, yeah, weatherman, you know, astronomer, the whole bit. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Naturalists, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. It all goes together Everything. with it. Yeah. Conservation, all that included. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so how's the Great Plains in like fall and even winter? Like, do you go travel out there like during those times of year? I have, and the thing that um, I've been there in September. I've also in, and been there in February because of the, the just the nature of them, right? There's a reason there's their grasslands is because most of them are fairly either semi-arid or arid climates. There's just not enough rain to support a lot of trees. 
Um, and even in, I'm going to say now, even probably now in mid June through the rest of the year, most of the grass has gone dormant. Um, just because of the lack of rain and the heat and, and you know just the climate is, is pretty severe um so honestly there's not a huge change <laughs> in the climate from or in the, the, the you know aesthetics of, of the plains right the grass is kind of browned out the trees are green you know they still have some leaves the few trees that are out there um but it's not you know there's not a dramatic change if the few trees that are out there in the fall you know they, they do get some color um but further north you go, the better, actually, the, the better the color gets and things like that. So up in North Dakota and the, the uh, there's the little Missouri Badlands in North Dakota there. It's a, it's an older area. So it's, it, it's a little more eroded. There's more, there's more vegetation, there's more sagebrush and, and more trees and things like that. So the color is a little more dramatic up, up in the, in the north, a little bit more than in South Dakota. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, in the winter, unless it snows, it, it, there's not a huge difference in, in terms of you know in terms of how it would photograph. I don't want to, want to downplay the you know the uniqueness of it, but in terms of making a photograph from it, it's not going to be radically different. Yeah, and, and circling back to uh, you talked a little bit earlier about uh, black and white photography because you do a large part of that. Um, How is it with certain times of seasons? Like, is there certain seasons are more suited for color images or black and white? Like what's your process with that? Um, I would say it's more, more than seasonal, even though I will say summer is, is actually a, a decent time for black and white, you know, when we tend to lose a lot of the early spring color and, and, you know, you can photograph, you know, and, and have a in the forest or something like that with a lot of green, you know, which might not make a great color photograph. You can still turn, you know, still because you're just relying on contrast and form and texture and all of those elements, you can still make a, a good black and white photograph. Um, it's more the time of the day as well that makes a big difference in, in terms of difference in photographing color and black and white. Um, is, you know, a little bit of the time of the year, you know, you can certainly make a black and white photograph in the fall when you have, you know, the trees changing and things like that. Um, it, it may be more suited for color at that time. It, it's just really the main difference is, is kind of um, the kinds of light that, that I look for in making black and whites. I'm looking for, you know, I, because again, we're relying on forms and textures and shapes and, and how the light and shadows are interacting. You know, I need, you know, we don't want that dawn and dusk kind of even, you know, glow that you get in that light because it tends to flatten out the contrast. You don't get that definition of the forms and the shapes like you do a little bit, you know, maybe within 30 minutes after sunrise, depending on, you know, where you're at and things. Where you got some nice, you know, softer light, but it has a little bit of a directionality to it. So it's creating those shapes. You know, by casting the shadows and showing the forms and the textures and things like that. Um, and again, depending on where you're at and what you're shooting, you know, that time of the day may may vary again because, you know, you, you're a lot of times you're at the mercy of just, you know, the orientation of things. And so a lot of times it'll involve visiting a site and seeing something just to figure out what time of the day I need to be there in order for the light to be right, to, to, to get cast the shadows the way I think they should be, or to, you know, to, just to show the shapes and really reveal the texture. Interesting. Yeah. So if you're, if you're there for a very limited period of time, will you shoot in less than ideal light or will you kind of just mark it down to come back eventually? Well, I, I probably will sh- shoot it as almost as a, but, you know, whether it ever makes it off of my, you know, computer or to, to do anything with it is, is probably not. It's probably more like I'll shoot it just to remind myself, too, that I need to go, you know, next time I go back, I'll, you know, try and hope, hope for better light. You know? mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, so switching gears a little bit, um, you print your images and exhibit them in galleries and festivals. Uh, what's been your experience with that and the process through it? Well, I, you know, I, I, I found during, um, I guess, the 
2019 and 2020 with the with the lockdown how much i really missed that you know it was mm -hmm. not having a venue to really because i was still getting out and shooting because most of the places i go to are you know not very crowded i'm outdoors you know there's no reason for me to stay indoors really i was not staying in hotels and things like that so you know i was having a lot less contact with people than you know probably than a lot of people might um but what i really missed was the opportunity to, to again show the work in the in galleries and at the art festivals and things like that for so for me it was just just a way to get your work out and be able to i, I just i i really enjoy talking to people about the photographs and about where they were at and what was going on with them and the stories behind them um it just you know, I just really enjoy that. And I, I really missed it for that year and a half. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. So and it, it's interesting because you can see in a lot, especially young kids, I just, I love to see their eyes light up when you start to talk about, you know, some animal or something. There's a photograph of a, an elk that they're looking at and you start to tell them the story about it and you can just see how they're, how they're affected by it. And it's like this, you know, little spark that ignites that you hope is going to, you know, keep going, you know, to really learn to love these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's definitely that curiosity of like, what am I looking at and want to learn more, you know, whether it's a kid or even adult, you know, and that, that's the cool thing about photography. It really is like, it's like a platform really to share these unique and special places that we need to really secure and protect. Yeah, yeah exactly. And it's one of the favorite th things for me about the art, you know, the art shows and the fairs and things like that. It's just being able to share that with people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so maybe break down a little bit more about those art festivals. Like, what's the process like? And even maybe the startup costs, setting up, selling your work. Like, how's it all kind of work? Um, well, yeah, the first thing, it's, it's a fairly big investment to get started. So it's one of those things, if you're going to commit to it, you kind of have to decide that you're going to commit to it because you can't do one a year um, just because of the tent costs and and you know you have to have for photographs you need some sort some sort of structure to actually hang them on um, and there's all kinds of stuff out there you know a tent can run I just I mean now that the costs of everything have gone up so much but a, a tent for a, t a 10 by 10 booth is now running anywhere you know from about two thousand dollars, depending on how many bells and whistles you want to add, you know it can go up quite a bit. Um, you have to have panels that you then can go inside of that that you can hang the work on. Um, you know it's got to be it has to be able to withstand the weather because you know it seems like almost inevitably it rains. You know um, at some point, um, and you don't want you know you got to be able to protect the work and then also make sure the tent stays put seen plenty of tents that have blown away in a pretty severe wind you know, wind or heavy rain they just get weighed down by the rain and collapse under the weight so you know um there's lots of horror stories you can hear about stuff like that you need a vehicle to be able to haul all this stuff around um then you have to have you know the inventory so it takes a little bit of time to build all that up in the cost of printing i do my own printing so it's one of the reasons i, I do my own printing is to it's a much less expensive venture to, to print things for myself for the shows. Um, um, and, and, you know, it's nice to have that flexibility and control over the work as well. Mm -hmm. um, doing your own, doing my own printing, you know, I can decide what size I want to do. And, you know, um, the cost again, just mainly the, you know, the cost, once you get past the cost of the printer and things, the cost of the prints themselves are substantially less than, you know, you can get them from anywhere. Right. Yeah. So d in regards to printing your work, did you start out like, did you go like a print lab first or was it like, did you kind of switch back to printing yourself? Like, was there any, did you ever try out that kind of avenue? Well, I, I started off um, with a relatively, I mean, it's still a relatively large printer or it would do 17 inches wide by you know, three or four feet long. So I could do a 16 by 20 or 16 by 24, which at the time I thought was a big print, you know. Um, and if I wanted anything bigger than that, then yeah, I had to go to a print lab to, to get those done. Um, 
And after a couple years, I think um, I just I bit the bullet and, and invested in a, a large format Epson, you know, uh, printer. So it now will print up to 44 inches wide. Um, so now I can do really large prints, um, which has just really opened up a whole new world for, for the work as well. I mean, it's just um, with doing these landscapes now and being able to, to print them like, you know, 32 by 48 or something like that. Um, it just really helps, you know, it, it actually feel it does the landscape more justice than the six, like a 16 by 20 print. It's just impossible to appreciate the vastness of, of some of these landscapes and the scale of some of them on a small print. And it's just having these large prints, you know, actually enable me to be more expressive of, again, that feeling and emotion of being in the place um, because you can't experience a, a really large print the same way you experience a, a 16 by 20 print, right? You, you have to take time to scan the print and engage with the print a bit more than the smaller scale stuff. And it really, you know, get absorbed into the print by the detail and this, you know, just the things you see on these larger prints that you really would just gloss, you know, kind of skim over on the, on the smaller scale stuff. So I've really, um, as, as in addition to the landscapes and doing them that way, just getting into these larger scale prints, because again, I feel it helps me express more completely what I'm trying to do through my images. Mm -hmm. So the, the connection between the actual taking of the photograph you know, experiencing it that way and then actually how you present it to the public. Now I, I feel I have a much better connection between those two, like being able to make these large, large prints. Yeah, it, it's more maybe personable because you printed it yourself too, which is really cool. Um, yeah, and it's great that you found like a context for your work to fit in with, like you said, with these large, expansive, uh, Great Plains landscapes. It's like just printing them large and expansive like that just fits fits the mold, I guess, of, you know, the body of the work too. I, I, th I think so. Yeah, I think so. It, again, it's, you know, just, I think it, it's, you know, again, um, you know, Ansel Adams, one of his quotes is that there's two people in every photograph, you know, the photographer and the viewer. And I just think these large scale prints really engage the viewer in a way that, you know, they, they can, they can, they can lose themselves in the image and kind of really start to, you know, engage and mentally get into it and experience it more fully than they, they could. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, for sure. And I think also, you know, you talked about wildlife with uh, the environment as well. Uh, those bigger prints too, they could get totally lost on smaller prints and small screens. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's awesome you're doing that as well. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, a bison on a 16 by 20 print and in the landscape, it looks like a, you know, it's a, that's a very small element, but when you can make it and still have the bison be a pretty substantial size, you're right. It just brings it to life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you're really, you're really too, is you're, you're really gaining depth there, you know, seeing the layers and seeing all the textures, and everything. So it's awesome. You, you print that big and you're successful with it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, and you also produce uh, coffee table style photo books. Um, what's been like your experience with that, putting those together? Well, you know, it was something else. I, I had this, I, I had some ideas when we were in lockdown during COVID of a couple of things I wanted to try. And that was one of them. Um, they were fun to do. Great to help me formalize my, my thoughts about a place, you know, because you, it forces you to do that. So it was worth it in that regard. Um, they weren't particularly profitable. <laughs> so, you know, um, but still, I, I think it was a worthwhile thing to do just for the experience of doing it. And like I said, it really helped me form, 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 formalize my thinking. And so, um, which helped me, I think, in some other ways with, you know, how I'm presenting the work, you know, some of the images I'm choosing and things like that. So it was a good experience. Um, again, just not particularly profitable. Yeah, definitely. Got it. Yeah. Nice way to curate your portfolio, maybe, or just you know, round it down to a series of photographs that work as a cohesive body too. But it, exactly, and I think um, it also helps think about 
the body of work that you're producing um, in terms of, you know, do you want to do, you know, like I, I tend to think we were talking about the Great Plains and some of these other things, right, where I'm, I'm, I'm working with a, I don't have a necessarily particular goal in mind, but there's a theme, right? I'm, I'm looking at, you know, how, to, how different aspects of the Great Plains and things like that. And so helping to put in this book together, putting these books together has really, again, helped me think about some, actually gives, gives me some other ideas as well, some of the things I can do you know, a little branching off in some other areas. Um, you know, it helped me formalize some thinking about, you know, the, the last 10, 15 years that I was photographing in, in the Appalachian Mountains, you know, I, I was able to pull some things together with that to, um, you know, just try and tell that story from my perspective, you know. Um, so things like that. Yeah, I, I think it's a great experience and I, and I would, you know, it's kind of nice with some of these online printing things now you can, do it almost for yourself and print one copy you know it's which is i think is a, it's a great experience mm -hmm. yeah definitely it's almost like a little mini project and it sets maybe your sights on like when you're out shooting to like you know produce maybe photographs for that series too exactly yeah definitely mm -hmm. yeah good henry <laughs> yeah sorry about that mate my Wi-Fi has been weird. It's, sorry if it, it's a delay. I'm just trying to see if you're talking and my um, Wi-Fi has been buffering. So. No worries. It's been a little oh. bit off here. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead. I'll continue on here. Um, so you've also um, produced, um, you know, a variety of content online. Um, you've been doing a happy hour Zoom call um, called the Photographers Forum. Um, you want to talk a bit about the that and how it got started? Well, it was, you know, it's funny how, again, it got started during COVID. Um, I think it was kind of started off as just a way to, to connect with, you know, local photographers and people that I, I knew and, you know, would see on an occasional basis, you know, there's some of the local camera clubs that had happy hours and things like that. You know, occasionally you would go to one and it was a good way to connect with people. So I, I just, you know, nobody was doing any of that stuff anymore. And I thought, well, it was just a good way to maybe connect with people. We could talk photography and do some things like that. Um, and that's how it started. And it kind of just kept going. Um, I kind of expanded it a little bit. It was to try and keep it a little more focused on, on photographic topics and discussions and things like that. Um, so we talked, you know, well, but it's, it's pretty laid back and pretty, um, unstructured, you know, we, I try and have a topic every week when we do have it just to, you know, maybe guide some questions and discussions, but, um, they, they kind of, you know, can wander off in, in lots of directions, but we definitely keep it, you know, focused on photography. Um, we get lots of different skill levels there. It's great. You know, we get people who are just starting off and have questions about cameras and, and, you know, some of the basic you know things of photography and um you know people that have you know been experienced and been shooting for for you know 40 50 years and are, are really you know well experienced and have a world of experience and everybody's you know everybody shares we, we occasionally will look at some some work you know if people just you know somebody comes back from a trip you know we, we invite them to share some work it's very very low key you know um it's always good especially if somebody has a particular questions about types of images or if something they they ended up with something not working out the way they wanted to you know there's there's enough people in these those groups that have a, a large variety of experiences that that we can almost always find somebody that has experience doing it and they can you know help them out so it's really just a good way to help you know answer questions help people out um share experiences share photos you know um and have a beer <laughs> <laughs> yeah for sure yeah it's cool how you're fostering that little community there where maybe people might have some i don't know like trepidation about asking like other photographers but you're creating this very laid-back atmosphere which um it's really really cool um, so, so what are like come like what are some of the topics and stuff that you may discuss there on the zoom calls well, um, you know, we talked a little bit about macro photography last time. Um, 
and I kind of brought that up because again, moving into the summer and things like that, it's a great, you know, it's a great time to get the macro lens out and do that kind of work, right? Because you can control the light, you know, you can focus in on one a group of flowers or a flower or a butterfly or, you know, any number of those things, right? Um, so we, you know, we spent some time talking about about that, the different kinds of subjects you can shoot, um, what equipment, you know, somebody might need, because there's a lot, that's, you know, you don't have to have macro lenses and you don't need a lot of equipment to go out and, and shoot those kinds of things. Um, so, you know, and then just, you know, some places that you could go if you didn't want to go, you know, if you didn't feel like you had something in your backyard, you know, there's some of the areas around, around the Dayton and, you know, kind of Northern Cincinnati area that you can go to. Um, you know, we didn't get heavy into techniques or any of that kind of stuff. Just tried to keep it pretty, you know, again, pretty laid back. Um, I, to not really intimidate anybody. I'm a, I'm a big believer in that for anybody that's just starting off, starting out, the, the key and the best thing you can do is just get out, take a lot of pictures and enjoy what you're doing. And, you know, the rest of it will come, you know. If you if you're happy with what you're doing and you're happy with your keeping your camera on program, then that's that's great. You know, there's you don't have to, you know, that's the great thing about photography is you can interact with it on whatever level you want and, and enjoy doing it. And that's I think that's the key for anybody that's doing it. Just get out, have a good time, enjoy what you're doing, experience nature or whatever it is you want to photograph. So um, you know we've talked a little bit about the landscape and some wildlife and you know usually that's related to some trip someone has made you know we'll get somebody who said they just came back from the tetons we'll look at their work and they'll, they'll share some of their experiences and things like that and you know we may ask them some questions and stuff like that um you know uh, we'll talk a little bit you know again different things like intentional camera movement you know you know blurring with zoom and, and you know just some different fun things you can try night photography and you know astrophotography um don't do a lot you know I, I don't know too many people that do street photography so if you know somebody that does street photography and wants to come talk about it uh, we actually had a guest on Rinzi Reeves. yeah we got the perfect guy yeah, yeah. I, I, I would connect with him I think he's based out of California and he's he does some great work and a lot of it's black and white too so you might love it yeah so I would love to yeah. yeah, so, you know, just, again, it's pretty laid back, you know, we're, we just wanted, I just wanted it to be a place where we could come, get together and talk about photography for a little bit without stress, no, you know, no intimidation, no, no worrying about your skill level or any of that stuff, just, you know. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, just keep it nice and chill, I guess. <laughs> That's really yeah. cool. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's awesome. And we'll, we'll make sure to uh, plug that down below for anybody because I'm sure there's a lot of co-audience there, you know, a lot of same topics. I'm, I'm sure our audience of, would enjoy that show. So Yeah, a lot Definitely. of local photographers there have been guests on or listened to the show, so that'd be great, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, we're so open. Love to have everybody. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so as we wrap up the show here, Tom, um, is there any big photo trips you have planned? Um, any upcoming art festivals this season? Uh, workshops or anything else you'd like to share? Um, sure. Yeah, I have, you know, the art show season is kind of in mid swing right now. So um, I have a couple up in the Cleveland area coming up, but the next ones I have in this area, I do the um, art on the commons at the, um, uh, the in, in Kettering. Um, and then I'll be in Springboro again. You did that one last year, didn't you? Right, Ryan? You were there? Uh, yep. Yep. Uh, art, art Fest on Maine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll be in Springboro. And those are my the only two I have left local. Um, I do have um, a couple workshops. I'm doing one in the um, Smokies in late September, first weekend in October to, to photograph the elk during the elk rut. Um, that's a lot of fun. That's one of my favorite ones to do over the year because it's, we keep it a really small group so we can move around quickly. Um, again, because, you know, as much as we try and get these animals to go where I want them to go, they never quite cooperate. So we have to be ready to move and um, position ourselves, you know, and reposition ourselves and probably reposition again. Um, but it's a lot of fun. They're just, they, these bull elk are just, you know, 
full of themselves, um, you know, <laughs> the ruts going on. Um, so, you know, you can get it, um, some really cool interactions with them. Um, so again, that's one of my favorite ones. And that's like the first week in October. And then, um, right now I have one left after that in, in the end of September in the, um, New River Gorge. So we're going to go down there and, you know, I'll shoot some fall color and, you know, along the New River Gorge in West Virginia. Awesome. That all sounds great. Yeah. Where, where's the best place for listeners to go and connect with you and see more of your work? Uh, my website is um, tomcrossphoto.com. Awesome. Awesome. Tom Cross, it's been, it's a, been a great conversation. Yeah. Oh, it was my pleasure. It's great. Thank you so much for watching the All Outdoors Photography Podcast. You can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and the video version on YouTube as well. You can subscribe down below, and we look forward to seeing you in the next one. Thank you.